we can. There we go. We are here again on a Thursday for Think and Link Pants Optional. Um, we have two amazing guests with us today, uh, Phil Liggett, whose voice you probably know really well if you've ever watched the tour, and Ed um, from Road ID, and we're going to have an amazing discussion, I'm certain of that, um, because of these two and because we've got the Tour de France coming up. Um, and even if you have only just been on a bike or just put a helmet on your head and, and, uh, and learned to bike, you know what the Tour de France is and how important it is and how big it is. And there's going to be a, a wonderful discussion about that. But first, I want to leave a moment for our, our number one sponsor. Um, we don't have any other sponsors this week. We typically, you know, say if anybody sends us anything free, they get to be a sponsor. Nobody sent anything free this week. Again, if you ever want to be a sponsor, all you have to do is send something free, right? Whatever it is. Kelly's address is? No, I'm kidding. That would be great. Um, we, <laughs> that'd be great. Uh, so our number one sponsor here is Capsule. We put this on um, because we're a curious crew, because we want to um, learn from our community and find new nuggets in the world and because we are in interesting times for certain. Um, and this is adapted from a series we did in our office in our kitchen years ago, but we made it pants optional because we're a flexible group um, and, and we like people to, you know, come up, come as they are, come as they, as, as they will. And I see a familiar face from the historical archives of Capsule, Mr. Greg Brosey is here on the line as well. We love him. And uh, we always say uh, video on, mute on. Uh, we want to see faces, but um, voices and comments and questions go in the chat. Um, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of them for these two. So um, as we get into this, uh, please definitely jump in with your questions for them. And if you ever want to attend this in the future, want to make sure you get the invite, there's a contact us section of the capsule site. Um, please go there and make sure your name is in there so we don't forget about you. Um, from there, I'm going to um, let our two guests introduce themselves. Um, we'll start with Ed and uh, give a little background why you're here, where you are specifically on the planet. So uh, and, oh, up to. and there we go with that good mute going on. Um, take it away, Ed. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Excited to be here. Glad to participate uh, today and uh, looking forward to this conversation. So I'm Edward Wimmer co-founder uh, and CEO of a company called Road ID. We do wearable ID uh, that communicates who you are, who to contact, and how to access medical information in an emergency. Our, our core reason to exist is to save lives, provide peace of mind, and fuel adventure. We are a 20-year-old, I know that's going to sound unbelievable, 20-year-old e-commerce company. So that puts us back on uh, launching our first website ever in 1999, and, and back then, for those of you that remember, there weren't a whole lot of e-commerce sites on the internet. It was us in this little company called Amazon that was selling books at the time. And uh, I like to say that one of us clearly figured something out that the other one, <laughs> other one didn't. So uh, Amazon is, uh, is who they are, but uh, they, they, they probably don't get as excited to come to work every day as we do uh, because of what we get to do in the world. So was that, uh, was that enough, Aaron? That's perfect. <laughs> that was wonderful. Mr. Leggett. Well, Kelly, you and I go back a long way because we've known you through a lot of the tours in the United States. And um, um, that's more or less the reason I'm here. But we all, I also go back a long way with Ed because we've supported his company since inception. I say we because I still think of Paul Sherwin being alongside me. And Paul was a great Road ID supporter. Got my Road ID on. It's yellow, by the way, everyone, because, of course, the Tour de France starts in 48 hours. And you can all smile, by the way. I can see you all, and you, some of you aren't smiling. So do smile. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you all. Um, I've been a journalist. I was a cyclist, first of all. I raced for about eight, eight or nine years. I actually had a 12-year career, but I didn't make many headlines. But then I started making headlines when I became a journalist. And, of course, this uh, tour starting on Saturday will be my 48th consecutive year on the Tour de France, except... I won't be on the Tour de France. I'll be in a studio in London commentating to the USA, 
where the rest of the commentary team are. We have one reporter on the race and he'll be reporting into the studios. I just hope it all works. Um, but if you see me nodding instead of speaking, you know it didn't work. So I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful. Uh, great to have you both, Phil, Ed. And yes, Phil, have a long history steeped in the sport of cycling. Really excited to have you here um, to share your perspectives. And Ed, a uh, big fan of Road ID for years. So I think we have a lot of Road ID wearers here on the call as well. So excited to hear more about the origin story. I have a Road ID. Oh, yeah. I have a Road <laughs> ID on my bike that gives my name and emergency contact. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. Oh. That's fantastic. Well, I, I have no doubt. Whoop, what was that? Oh, okay, thanks. I heard, heard another voice. Um, well, I know we, there's no doubt we have a lot to, to cover today and um, and it will be a, certainly an entertaining and an inspiring conversation for sure. Um, I wanna dive right in if we can, um, because I think this is on a lot of people's minds, those that are following professional sports or outdoor enthusiasts um, in their own right. Uh, and, and Phil, we were talking a little bit about this earlier this week. Uh, let's talk about the impact this pandemic has had on sport and active living. Obviously, the Tour de France pushed from a July start now into late August. Um, we're obviously excited that it's happening, but obviously there's some mixed reviews about how that will be handled, uh, public roads, how do we keep our spectators safe, our athletes safe, staff, et cetera. Um, and, and we, we also know that this is, it's a global pandemic, uh, but obviously the, uh, it, there's some variety across countries and regions in terms of, of, uh, of the intensity of how this impact or how this pandemic has impacted the lives of these, these various um, individuals. So I'd love to get your perspective, both of your perspectives on these general impacts, the pandemic's impact on the future of sport. So currently what we're seeing now and the future of sport. And then I'd love to end on a positive note and let's talk about some of the positive outcomes that we've all seen um, coming out of this in terms of growth of outdoor activities. So Phil, would you like to start? It'd be great. Okay, well that one question alone, Kelly, could take us through till seven o'clock tonight, which is two hours from now, by the way, in my country. Um, <laughs> probably is in yours as well. Um, for me, the pandemic started in South Africa, where I live at, in February on a farm, which and I, I work with the people and helping save the lives of the rhino. And we've watched our, the people that we helped uh, in the local, um, local townships. We've got them into business. And right now, those poor people have got no work and Africa is in a terrible state. They're taking it hard because they haven't got the the resources to climb out of the problem, whereas we probably have. As far as the sport is concerned, where we have to, we were locked down an extra two months. They wouldn't let us out the country, they closed the airspace. The British government actually got us out, back to the UK. And once we got home, then we, we lived the strangest, uh, well, since the 27th of May, we have lived the strangest life, myself and my wife, because the Great British Pub hasn't existed for us. The, the restaurants we haven't gone to. I've been riding my bike alone. My garden is pristine because I've not worked at all. My last TV commentary was in January. It'll probably show on Saturday when I start talking on the Tour de France. But the way it's affected the sport, uh, I first of all, I, what on earth would we have done without the likes of Zwift and the virtual reality bicycle rides? What would the pros have done? There was, they couldn't have gone out in many parts of the country at all, more than five kilo, well, three miles of the house. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, they couldn't have got anything like the form to have turned up and, and ridden the Dauphiné like they did the other week. And you can tell by the regions that the rides have lived in, like the Colombians came into France earlier, they're going very well. People like Geraint Thomas stayed back in the UK. He clearly wasn't going so very well. Um, so the sports have struggled. Other sports in Britain, well, our Premiership football, which is probably the best league in the world, just stopped. And then they started to get it back in, uh, in empty audience, empty stadiums. So when you turn your telly on, they've got canned clapping. And we, the commentators joked about pressing the button when it's time to applaud and pressing the button when it's time to boo. 
and you get in the wrong order, you make you look a bit silly. Um, and it's just been bizarre. We we've had uh, now that now they've started other sports as well. They're putting cardboard cutouts in the seats because people aren't sitting there. It's um, we are living a totally different world, and I don't think uh, it's gonna we're gonna lose this way of life for at least another year. So I'm just hoping that we. I think the sport has has actually acted unbelievably well to make it happen uh, and get the sport going again, it, which it did from the 1st of August. I don't know how they've done it. Now, the French government have backed the Tour de France and they worked very hard to get the race on. For the riders, it's been a journey which is still a journey of doubt. I spoke to all the, well, nearly every team manager in the Tour de France in the last six days. And the one question I've asked them is, will you get to Paris? There's a silence, and then they say, we don't know. But we will ride like we're going to Paris. So I saw a press release today where Jumbo, Jumbo Visma, which has got the fav one of the favourites on the team, said they're not going to try and dominate the race in the first week in, in the belief that the race might end. So that if they've got the race leader after week day five, they would be the winner of the Tour de France. That's what would happen. So others are others are taking opportunities. Other that's why we'll see such an immensely exciting first week. Others are going to race this race for their first yellow jersey, thinking it might be the last, and therefore they've won the Tour de France. All different uh, types of uh, tactics are going to come into play. The riders themselves are all in Nice now. Uh, they're all in a bubble. They're not allowed to mix with anybody, only their own t staff. Uh, the riders largely are sleeping in separate rooms, whereas normally they're twin rooms. Having said that, some teams believe that they are so well protected and they've done all the right things that they are the safest guys in the world right now. They're almost invincible. So a lot of them are sharing rooms because they said we'd not be near anybody who's suspected of having COVID. We've done all the tests. I think the one worry, and it is a, it is a big worry that everybody fears, uh, this week in the in the racing in Brittany, where they've had two big bike races going on, they have also they had to reject the Bora Hansgrohe team, three riders tested positive just before the race started. So they mm -hmm. got them out, took them, sent them home with the whole team. Nobody on that team are going to the Tour de France. Otherwise, they would have been out of the Tour de France because they have to serve a 14-day self-quarantine. Now. Um, that's okay, that worked. Three hours later, the same test was conducted, they were negative. Mm -hmm. So how, are the, how can they be positive once and negative next? And that's the big fear of the race. If they do a test the morning of the race, they get positive, they kick the team, more than two positives, you're on your way home as a team. Uh, and then what happens when you get home and you're a negative? Get out of the Tour de France. So there's big fears that uh, this could happen. They reckon that the test that they do is only 75% uh, reliable. So it's been a different year for everybody. But I'll tell you, everybody is hoping and praying the tour gets to Paris because the feeling is if the tour doesn't get to Paris, the season will end. Uh, I don't share that personally, but that's what they think. Right. And ultimately, the government has the final say, right? As yes, they do. Uh, in fairness, the governments have been right behind the French race because they know what it means to France and what it means to, to their country in general, not just the ride. Um, most of the riders have been in France. They've been in France for weeks, just in case somebody closed the door and you had to self-quarantine if you came in from, say, Colombia. So they've all been in France um, and they've all been riding in their own little training camps away from everybody. Nobody allowed in the hotel they stayed in, etc. So they are, I mean, you can't do much more than that. They have been shielded from the virus. Um, so we can only hope it happens, but nobody can stop the crowd on the hills. They'll be there. They stop them at the finishes. They won't be at the finish so much at all. Um, and rules are when, when you're off your bike, the masks go on. So on top of the mountains, when you're really short of oxygen, that, uh, that could be pretty tough. Yeah, putting a mask over your mouth and you're trying to gasp for air, but it's going to be a very interesting three weeks. And the route is one of the hardest in the last six, seven years. And it's, it's just 
will be a tremendous race. The sprinters, we might see them on five days out of the 21. That's all. The rest will be a real battle. Um, it's going to be extraordinary. They're entertaining for sure. Whether you're a cycling fan yeah. or not, the Tour de France always brings the entertainment. Yeah. I'm just wondering how I'm going to describe a chateau or a bird flying 3,000 miles from where I'm sat. But uh, we'll work on that. Right. <laughs> I think you'll manage. <laughs> Thank you for that perspective. And, and, um, and, and Ed, obviously, so we, we have the professional sport and we have the sport of cycling. And, and then we talk about the outdoor enthusiasts and um, outdoor activity and how we've actually seen growth, significant growth over the last several months. Um, and I, what, what's your perspective? Or what are you seeing? Obviously, the positive aspects of not of the virus, but what are we seeing in terms of outdoor activity, health and wellness? Um, people just getting outdoors. Yeah, before, before I answer that, I'll, um, I want to say that I, I feel a little disadvantaged uh, speaking today following uh, the legendary Phil Liggett. Not only is he very, <laughs> very capable on the, uh, the microphone and a, uh, a legend, um, he also has a British accent which is, we all know that as Americans, we think people with British accents sound a lot smarter. So I, I will do my best. Yeah. Um, well, it's work for me, Ed, but I'm not so sure I'm smarter. <laughs> so yeah, I, I also want to remark on something Phil said. I'm glad he brought up uh, Africa and how, you know, some of the unique challenges there, because I think as, as Americans, we can tend to be a little bit geocentric and, and see our worldview uh, only and the way it's impacting us here at home in the, in the first world. And, um, and, you know, while there have certainly been very tough challenges experienced by, uh, by folks here, uh, we need to not forget about the other places in the world that may have things uh, a little bit more challenging than we have. Uh, on, on the topic of sport, yeah, um, it has been really interesting to see people head outdoors, and, and, and I think the spotlight on the on the mental health side of sport has has really been great. So, and I don't think people necessarily think about it in terms of oh, I need to tend to my mental health. I need to get outdoors. I need to go for a walk, or go for a run, or go for a bike ride. Uh, I don't think people necessarily think about that so much, but it was the natural reaction to, to handling the craziness and the stress involved with this, uh, this pandemic uh, that, that we're in. And a lot of, I think a lot of mental health is, uh, uh, can be tended to through watching sport. And so our ability to, to socialize and communicate and all those things that help, uh, help us get through, through, through the day was hampered. And then our ability to, to watch sport, something that we do for a, uh, a release and for fun and to, uh, for some escapism uh, wasn't, wasn't around. So uh, as, a, as a people, we naturally headed outdoors. We, we started uh, getting back into fitness, things that were allowed. You could go for a run, you could go for a bike ride, you could go for a, for a walk in the woods uh, or a hike up a, a up a mountain. So, and we have uh, we have seen that. I and you have like everyone that's tried to go into a bike shop to buy a bike in the last uh, in the last three months have seen it. You just you just can't buy them. There are kids in my very own neighborhood that can't get their hands on a bicycle because they're sold out. So the the bicycle business, the fitness business, has been really great, uh, really strong amidst all this craziness. And I'll say, you know, at Road ID, we're seeing the real impacts uh, of that too. I always look back to March 11th this year as the day that it, it really became real for, for us at Road ID and for me. Uh, that was the day we sent our, our team home and said, you're safer, you're safer at home than you are here. And then we saw that's it. We saw our first day of sales decline on March 11th as well. And that was followed for, you know, and this is perhaps interesting for the, the business owners, the entrepreneurs uh, in, in the audi audience. We saw nine straight days of sales decline as I think the whole world was coming to grips with what's going on here and how bad is this going to be? 
And then we started seeing some of the positive effects of people getting outdoors. Sales started gradually ticking back up and ticking back up. And we ended up, uh, you know, with a, a record April and a record May because people are seeing the value in being protected as they get, uh, as they get outdoors more. So I think the, what, you know, uh, there's a long-term impact question here for not only professional sport, but for recreational sport. And I think it's really hard to determine that right now. We're seeing youth sports come back, um, you know, it, it, which I find really interesting because a lot of public school systems are still not open, but public school system sports are. Uh, so that, uh, that is a, uh, a, an interesting dynamic that is happening. But kids need, need to get outdoors and they're spending more time on their bicycles, which is awesome. And where I would like them as a lover of the sport of cycling and a lover of the sport of running and a lover of the outdoors, I like it when kids do more of those activities. But I think when, when soccer uh, uh, comes back online in full force and football and basketball and, and some of the other predominant team sports here in the States, I think we're gonna see, uh, we're gonna see an immediate return to, uh, to those activities. Hmm. Changing perspective, yep. Yes, thanks, Ed. Thank you both. Oops. Aaron's got a question, but you're muted, I believe, Aaron. What's your ear pods? You're having an ear pod issue. <laughs> there we go. Still can't hear you. Okay, while we're waiting for Aaron to come back online, because he will, he will momentarily, he's gonna figure that out. Um, let's just follow up. And I think this, Aaron, may have been a question you had that we'd love to ask both of you um, in terms of, and you touched on this a little bit, Ed and Phil, in terms of positive behaviors and changes that we're seeing in these last few months. Um, but lo would love to hear from both of you, um, specific organizations or individuals that stand out in both of your minds, really as it pertains to humanitarian efforts. And again, Phil, you touched on this, what's happened in Africa, you both did. Um, and, and really the greater good, we're seeing organizations really step up and not really, not only for the optics of it, but truly making a difference. Can you think of any specific organizations or individuals that you've, that you've seen or heard or are interacting with that are making Well, as I, uh, as I said, Kelly, I, um started out my lockdown in South Africa, a very remote part of South Africa, I was 300 miles from the airport and we're on the banks of a river. Um, because there's nobody lives there, the animals really did roam free because, and there was nobody came to visit because tourism was stopped. So the animals became almost next door neighbors to us, literally. Um, but our, of course, all the friends that we helped, they had no form of income at all and they, they went down pretty quickly. Um, and the one thing I find about the African people is life can be tough, but you never hear them complain. It's an amazing nation. Um, but then we, uh, since then what has happened, we lose on average two rhino a day uh, poached. And because mm -hmm. the airspace has been closed and partly because we have continued our security patrols probably even bit better, we haven't had a single rhino poach now for a record for the last 12 years. Um, in December was the last time they took a rhino. So that's really something that, that's really come from the, from the situation that people cannot operate because they can't get the, the horn out of the country by air uh, to Vietnam or China, where, it's, where it goes. So that was a big positive. When we came back to England, um, well, after the, the last job my taxi driver had was to bring me home from the airport at the end of May from South Africa. And I saw him this morning because I, my wife's gone to Poland there today. And uh, he sold his car, his taxi. So he's been, because I've known him so long and he's driven me all over, he's bought a new car and he works for me, but he's, he's actually left the business. And it's a big problem here because in London now, from 20,000 of our famous black cabs, only 2,000 are working and they're just not taking any money because the government's closing the city down for walkers and bicycle riders and they're fencing the roads off so they can't get the fare in the car because of the wrong side of the barriers. 
So there, it's it's completely changed the centre of our city, um, which is 25 miles from where I am right now. I'm in the country here. So, um, and people have, well, cyclists have gone mad. You're absolutely right, Ed. Um, you can't get out my driveway onto the country lane on a Sunday or a Saturday, and even in a weekday. They are coming past in droves. I remember my next door neighbor, he said, I was digging the garden today, and in half an hour, I counted 80 cyclists. He said, what's gone wrong with the world? I said, well, we're just learning to enjoy ourselves, I said, at, uh, because not many of my friends in the village are cyclists, but the, everybody's talking about bikes now. They're realizing their health. They make me laugh when I see them go off with the saddle too low and pedaling with their insteps instead of their toes. But at least they're making an effort and they're starting to feel a lot better for it. That's the biggest change, is people are adapting to a different lifestyle. And I can't see us going back to the old lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I just can't see it happening. Right. And that's, uh, that's the way it is. And some of that's very positive changes, to your point. Bill. Oh, be, oh, very, oh, absolutely. No, very much so. One that's not so positive is my, my village pub, which used to open at 5.30 until 11 o'clock at night, now opens at 12.30 and closes at half past nine at night. And he says he's never going back to the old hours because everybody likes going to the pub early and going home to bed. But actually, it sounds as though I drink a lot, but I haven't been to the pub since February. I'm going when I I'm going when I finish with you, Kel, because I've got no, to tell them. No, I've got to tell them they won't see me for three weeks because I'll be working far too late every day on the Tour de France. Uh, I, I want them to know where I am. Yeah. That's Thank true. you. Thank you for sharing. Ed, any any thoughts, any organizations, individuals that you see are doing doing good during these times and making permanent changes for the better? Uh, I, from I, the fight. Oh, sorry. Ed. Yes, carry on, please, Ed. I, <laughs> thanks, Phil. I uh, I think I'm going to give a lot of credit to uh, to the small business community. Um, rather than the large organizations that are making, uh, you know, making commitments and, and doing the responding to this in their own way. I, I have never seen as much tenacity among, uh, among people as I have during this, this pandemic. Um, I heard this quote the other day. It says that uh, from somebody I know that said, tough times don't last, tough people do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just so, so true. This is, we're in a tough time and it's going, it's going to have an end to it. Um, and the tough people are going to figure out how to get from, from where we are to, to that point in the future where things are perhaps a little better. And I, you know, I think we've all seen it in our communities, you know, uh, businesses being flexible and adaptable to this situation and letting uh, and figuring out how to work from home and letting their, their teams work from home and in less ideal situations. We've seen it from, uh, from restaurant owners that have tried to figure out how they don't go out of business. I've got, there's a, there's a restaurant right on the other side of this building that's behind me that uh, went to carry out. And uh, during the, the mad dash for toilet paper, uh, he happened to be sitting on a bunch of it uh, at, at, in, his, uh, in his building that they weren't using because they weren't open for, uh, for dine-in uh, uh, business. So he was giving away a free roll of toilet paper for everybody that placed a, placed a carry-out order. And it was wow. just a genius little bit of, of marketing, uh, but that doesn't come without realizing, without you know, picking yourself up by your, your your old bootstraps and figuring out how, out how you're going to get from point A uh, to point B. You know, life, life is tough. It's gonna throw a lot of punches at you. And just, and just figuring out how to put one foot in front of the other. And I, I you know, I, I can walk around this community here in Northern Kentucky and you guys can walk around your communities and you can see example after example of example with small, small business men and women that have just figured out how to make things work in a far less than ideal time. And I think that's, that's a great spirit among people. I think as, as Americans, we might take credit for that being in uh, the American spirit, but it's happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. oh, it's man. a great perspective. Yes, inspiring. Thank you. Yes. Thank you both. Aaron, you're back. Am I back? Can you hear me? 
Oh, good. Thank goodness I'm back. Um, though I would have just listened the entire time. I'd have been fine with that and just let you take over, Kelly. The, um, uh, I do want to, the, the comment I wanted to make was we do have uh, a friend from QBP on here um, who can attest to the, uh, to also that incredible growth in bike sales and, and what that's done to the supply chain and how fascinating that is and how many people are out on bikes. I also, Bill, as you mentioned, I see bikers all over the place all the time. I don't see as many helmets as I see bikers. That's a little worrisome because you'd think the helmets would go with the bikes. And unfortunately, people aren't protecting that really rather important asset. Um, I want to I want to jump to one of our questions, not to um, but to set up the conversation that I really want to make sure we spend a lot of time on, um, which is the, the Paul Sherwin project. Um, I can't take credit for the name earlier before this. I want to take credit for the name because I think, I think it's a, a phenomenal choice of name for this, for this effort. And, and, but I want to make sure that we have enough time to talk about that and what you've been working on and what kind of sparked um, having you on, not only the Tour de France, obviously the timing is perfect, but having the two of you on to talk about that. Um, so if you don't mind just going into that, telling us about why this has come about and what you've been working on. Uh, around the Paul, the Paul Sherwin project. Fill All right, in. well, uh, I'll, uh, thank you, um, Aaron. Well, Ed was the man that first came to us um, when he, he founded the company, Road ID, and we fell in love with it, both Paul and I together. He came onto the, uh, it was, this, was it the Tour du Pont, Ed, when we first met? I, I can't think remember. it was California. Tour de California, okay. Yeah. and. Um, I remember you paid for dinner, so it was a pretty good day. <laughs> and uh, and we um, we just loved your idea. It seemed an absolute uh, no-brainer to to wear your name and have a contact number, and uh, and all the information to anybody who found you um, and could save your life. So it was an obvious no-brainer. So we were delighted to join you, and we we had some fun times too, making those crazy advertisements with Bob Rowe in those portal or whatever you call them in <laughs> bathrooms and we we had some terrific times and i i was i, I i'm not surprised in the least that uh, you've made a terrific success of the company and so yeah so only in the last what i suppose the last five weeks or so we've we've, we've been looking for some way to remember paul and um, paul um those of you that don't know was my partner on television i brought him into the business after he retired as a, a top professional in 1986, and we spent 33 years together. He always sat on my left, and uh, so that seat had to be filled uh, last year by a new commentator. It was Bob Rowe, who was in fact a great friend of Paul, so Paul would have approved, but it's not Paul showing. And Paul's uh, still with us. We think about him every day, and we, we know what he was doing because he was African. If you asked him, he has an English passport. He was born in Widnes, which is in the northwest by Liverpool. And I was born 12 miles away from him, uh, 12 years apart as well. And so when Paul, uh, when my wife asked Paul what he thought he was, he said, Ugandan. First, straight off. He's very proud of his Ugandan passport because he helped the tribal people in Uganda, the Karamoja tribe, and they... They were totally devastated when Paul died very suddenly on December the 2nd, 2018. Uh, they all rode bikes because of Paul. Paul could speak their language fluently. He was brought up with kids in the fields. So he was one of them. He showed them how to do things. He showed them how to be entrepreneurs. He showed them how to make tented camps and sell them to tourists and give them a, a time that their tourists would bite their fingers off to come and do. And so his death left a big hole. So we wanted to continue what uh, Paul had started. I'm also after a total different connection. Paul and I walked in parallel, but not with any effort at all. I've, I've worked out in South Africa. Paul works in Uganda. And so uh, this, is, this is an idea that we came together. And, and Ed's company came up with the first big idea to raise some bucks. And that was to make these special wristbands uh, I, can't, I can't go being see it. I, I can't, I haven't got myself up on board. Um, and uh, we're, we're letting them go out during the Tour de France. Some of the riders in the Tour will be wearing them. And 
We've designed the wristband. Thanks, I can see Greg, uh, Greg Bose online. So thank you, Greg, for all your efforts to bring the design to reality. Uh, and it's got the Ugandan mixture of colors in there. Africans are very colorful people. And the band is very colorful and there's a little memento on there, a moment of remembering Paul. Um, and I hope we sell an awful lot of them because thanks, uh, we promised not to bankrupt uh, Ed's company, but he's giving us an awful lot of the wristband money into the fund. And this money will eventually go to, go to Africa to continue Paul's ideal over there. As you know, Paul was a great commentator. He was a fun liver. We laughed our way around the Tour de France every year for 25 days in total. Um, uh, we never had a bad time uh, and the tour flew by. Unlike what's gonna happen these next three weeks when I'm sat by myself in London. Uh, and so we're working very closely with Paul's wife and his kids and everybody else, and indeed Kelly. So yeah, you, you take it from there, Ed. Yeah, I don't know that I, <clears throat> excuse me, that I can add a, uh, a lot to that. I can, um, I can only say that we are very proud to be a, a, a small part of this. Uh, I consider it a, an immense pleasure to have had the opportunity to get to know Paul and Phil uh, through uh, attending various bike races around, around the world. Um, he was an incredible human being with a, an amazing smile, a sharp wit and sarcasm uh, that would be hard to, hard to top. So he spoke uh, frequently and left an impression on me uh, about, about Uganda and East Africa. And I, uh, I'm just humbled to be part of this project uh, that will continue the work of empowering, uh, empowering people in Africa. East Africa, whether it be through economic development or skills training um, and, and some other things I'm sure the project will get involved in. So humble to be a part of it. The band is, is pretty cool. Uh, love the, the design that came out. And uh, I, like Phil, I hope we sell a whole bunch of them. Uh, not because that's very meaningful to Road ID, but I think it'll be very meaningful to, uh, to, to the project. So um, it's um, cool to be here. Uh, to Ed, I've got, a, I've got this, these pictures of Paul. I don't know if you can see them all, but can. you can see the type of guy Paul was. Um, the bottom picture on the, on the left-hand side, my left anyway, is a great cyclist, Alan Piper, an Australian cyclist, now a, a national uh, director sportif on the Tour de France. Uh, they were so close friends. It was Paul Sherwin couldn't climb mountains, and so Alan Piper gave him the nickname Climber. But I'll tell you what, Paul stayed and waited for him when he was on the mountains of the Tour de France and got him to the finish so he wasn't eliminated. The top picture there, well, you can see him. That's when he's in his true love, wearing his hat and getting amongst the Karamoja people. And that there is how I remember him. Laid back, casual, happy, highly intelligent guy and heart in the right place. Thank you, Bess. Thank you both. And, and I, I'll just mention as an aside, and, and I'm honored, and, and Paul was a dear friend of mine as well, and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to, and, and I said honored to be, to be a part of this, this Paul Sherwin project. I did include, for those interested in the chat, a link to this. It is a, in fact, a limited edition uh, Road ID wristband um, in honor of Paul. Uh, that you can purchase here. Obviously, um, a percentage of that will go back to the, the project as we continue to support the good that Paul was, was enacting in Uganda and really across East Africa. So, um, so again, Phil and, and Ed, thank you, Road ID. That, that partnership is, is tremendous. And we're excited to see how that plays out during the tour as well. I think we've got some teams that are, that are going to be supporting this initiative. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, thank you. Um, very, very positive things happening there. Um, I, uh, I'm gonna shift gears really quickly because I love um, Ed, because it's, it's a fun story and you, you touched on a little bit, but just for the group, um, talk a little bit about, and you obviously you founded Road ID back in 1999 and there's the story on the website about how, what, what inspired you to, to, to co-found this, this company with, with your father. But can you talk a little bit about the origin story around Road ID for those that, that aren't aware and 
and share a little bit about that. And then we, because we have a lot of entrepreneurs on the call, um, let's talk about what it means to be an entrepreneur. Some of the, the behaviors and the traits that you found, resilience certainly being one of them, um, uh, that uh, are any advice you'd give, I guess, for would-be entrepreneurs. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> you might have to bring me back to some of those questions because as I tell the road ID story, I, uh, I, I, I might get sidetracked. Um, I love telling, uh, love telling the story uh, in, in many ways because it really gives credit where the credit is due, which is to my father. So I, it was, the year was 1999. I was a college senior at a uh, small school in Kentucky called Georgetown, uh, Kentucky. It's not Georgetown in DC. It's Georgetown in, in uh, the heart of the state of Kentucky. And I was finishing up my last year of collegiate soccer. And I was pretty fit at the time. And I was trying to figure out what was next uh, for my, uh, my athletic endeavors. And some friend of mine, friend, friends of mine that were on the cross country team, uh, they were in, in the same situation. They had finished up their last year of collegiate cross country and trying to figure out what was next. And they decided to run a marathon. And so I threw my hat in the ring and said, I'll, I'll run this marathon with you guys. And for, for what it's worth, if we have any college students uh, in, the, in the audience today, senior year of college is not an ideal time to train for a, a marathon. But nonetheless, we, we went about uh, this, this training and long runs on country roads, 16, 18 miles at a time on the, on the weekends. And uh, because I was a, uh, a good son, I would make those obligatory calls back home to the folks to let them know I was still alive. Uh, that those calls happened once every uh, week or two. And it was during one of those calls with my dad that I've told him about marathon training. And he said, Merrill, what? And I said, marathon, we're, uh, we're running uh, very long distances. It's 26.2 mile race. And he thought that was kind of a silly idea uh, at, at the time and uh, said it was dangerous. And on that phone call, he asked me to carry some form of ID with me. He said, what if you have an accident? How will I, as your father, be, uh, be contacted? So please, Edward, carry some form of ID. And at 21 and uh, uh, thinking I was invincible, I ignored his concern and went about marathon training. And it was literally the weekend after that phone conversation that I was nearly hit by a pickup truck. And I say nearly because thankfully I wasn't. Uh, I put myself in a ditch on the side of the road to, be, to avoid being hit. And from that ditch, I like to say that I had two very scary realizations. One is that I could have been hit. I could have been fighting for my life, unconscious, unidentified in a local hospital, and nobody would know who I was, who to contact, or how to access medical information. And that, uh, my dad's words came back about carrying ID, and that, that hit home. On a, uh, on a much lighter side, the second realization from that ditch was that for the first time in 21 years of life, I had to finally admit that my dad might be right about something. So shortly thereafter, uh, graduated school, went home, trying to figure out what, was, uh, what I'm going to do with my life. And this idea of wearable ID came about. And uh, my dad and I uh, decided to start this company, which is now Road ID. We were both broke. I was a broke college student. Uh, he, uh, he had some uh, business dealings that didn't go all that well. So he was broke. But I had two credit cards that each had a $5,000 limit. And I, I got those because I wanted the free t-shirt that came along with signing up for the credit card app. So those of you that are old enough uh, in, in the audience will remember doing that kind of thing. So we had these two credit cards, $5,000 limit, and we decided to give this thing a shot. And uh, that was all, all the capital we had. So things started very slowly. But then we, we got our first story from, our, from a customer. It was actually a young man's father. Uh, the, the son was a, was a cross country runner and he was hit by a car while training for his cross country season. And because he was wearing a road ID, his parents were called and they were able to see him in the hospital uh, almost as soon as the ambulance got there. And that story, I think, changed our lives. It put us on a, uh, a different path and a deeper mission. So we like to say that our core purpose is to save lives, provide peace of mind, and fuel adventure. 
Um, we do that by improving the outcome of accidents and emergencies, and our product is a simple ID uh, that you wear that can communicate the important information to the right people at the, at the right time. But what keeps us motivated are those stories. Uh, you know, that, that young man, Brian, uh, was our first one, but now they are, and this is not an exaggeration, near daily. We hear from people of all, of all stripes, of all ages, of all backgrounds, about how their road ideas have made a difference in their lives. And some of them are, are fairly benign. They trip over a curb, uh, they're injured, but when EMS shows up, instead of having to relay all the information, they just hand over their road ID and does all the talking. Uh, we also have stories, uh, and many of them, where people say they wouldn't be alive today without their road IDs because they got them the right help at the right time. And then we have uh, very tragic stories. There's one that I will never be able to shake, and I actually have a hard time even talking about, but I, uh, a mother posted on our Facebook page, and she said because her son was wearing it when he got hit by a car, that she was able to be at the hospital enough time to say goodbye. You tell her son she loved him one last time. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, mm -hmm. that's, why, that's why we do what we do and why we wake up um, every day to come to, to this place and tell these stories so that we can, make a, we can make a difference in people's lives. And- Yeah, thank you for sharing yeah. that. You, Jeff Bezos is not telling that story. And I'll say, uh, you know, if there's, a, if there's a business lesson in that story, it would be that if you're, going, if you're going to embark on an entrepreneurial journey, you better love what you're doing because mm -hmm. time, there will be really tough times. There'll be times when, when you're gonna wonder how uh, you're gonna pay the bills. It'll be, uh, the, hopefully there will be great times, but there will definitely be tough times. So the way you get through those, uh, through those tough times is to love what you're doing so much that you feel an obligation to, to provide that to the world. That's inspiring. Thank you, Ed. I'm choked up too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well. Oh, it's okay. We're... Sometimes I get through that story just fine. Uh, other times it, uh, yeah. it's rough. Yeah, you've told me that actually. Yeah, that's right. uh, Eddie, if you click on the chat and read all the chapters, you've got an awful lot of supporters uh, with us today. Mm -hmm. All in supporting you. So the... Yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Doing the work, that's for sure. Right then, would you better liven us up now, Kelly? Okay, let's make it something fun. Uh, actually, this is a cycling-related question um, because I'd like you both to give your predictions for oh. this year's Tour de France. And I know, Phil, you, this will come out in the broadcast and Bob Key's going to kill me because <clears> I have to hear. But let's hear from both of you. If you had a thought, Ed um, but, and Phil, just would love to hear who you think is going to take um, the yellow. I, I am sure we're going to see a great bike race. If it's allowed to reach the finish, it will have been a terrific tour. I'm sure of it. Um, I have a feeling Ineos have come here. The reason they've shown no sentiment and kept Chris Froome or Geraint Thomas on the team means one thing. They've got the team that can carry Egan Bernal to win a game. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and for that reason, an English team with the biggest budget in the world is only one British rider on it. And he comes from Wales, not even from England. Oh, what a disaster. Don't tell Luke Rowe I said that, because he's a good mate. Um, the Jumbo Visma has shown all the class that they possibly could uh, guide Roglic. They've had some bad luck because they've lost one of their top riders in Christlike with an accident. Mm -hmm. uh, one or two riders have got quite a few riders turning up with a few scars from the August racing. Um, there's EF, the Education First, the American team, I think has a most exciting team. And they have two riders there that could win this tour. Mm. Uh, and that would be, well, it would send Jonathan Waters into seventh heaven. I know that he's the owner of the team, but I think he's got a great team and I wish him well. There's 41 first time riders in the Tour de France this year. There's only, I think it's three Americans. There's only two Australians. These figures are so low, four British riders. These are the lowest figures for years and years and years. The Colombians have got eight, just showing how they're coming from Colombia. Mm -hmm. And the Danes have got eight. Finally, they've got so many good riders. 
So I think we've got the, the menu of a, of a great race, and it'll start on day one. Day two, they're in serious hills. Day three, they go to Sister on, they're in the gateway to the house, but they turn away and head down to the central massif. Um, but I think the, uh, even the first day, although it's a long, flat finish on the Promenade des Anglais, it is not a flat approach. The Alpmara team are sinuous, narrow, horrible roads when you race. They're the most beautiful roads in the world when you ride your bike for pleasure. And so if it's wet, the descents will be horrific. And on the first day, everybody knows the man that wins the stage could be the winner of the Tour de France because it might mm -hmm. be stopped by Tuesday. We never know. Mm -hmm. So I think we're in for a great race. I think the answer, simple answer is Bernal will win. Uh, but hey, I haven't picked a winner since 2008 when Carlos Sastra won. And my pub all put bets on him. I had a free night in the pub when I got back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you heard it here first, Phil Leah. And, and Ed, before we jump to you, because I'd love to hear your predictions, the possibility of there being an asterisk with the yellow jersey winner this year under the circumstances, I mean, in the record yeah. books, how does that, and I know there's not an answer to that yet, Phil, but I'm curious, and I'm sure that'll be talked about during the broadcast. Um, if you stop the tour in a week, how does that well, fare for... It will be the, it's the official end, so the, it will go in the record books. Yes, it'll say tour only six days or four days or what, 20 days or whatever. Right. Because don't forget this year, they, they had cancelled Paris-Nice a day from the finish because right. that the uh, pandemic was getting a grip of France. So they're not afraid to do it if they have to. In fact, they'll have no choice because the government will shut them right. down. Right. But we'll see. We'll see. It'll I'm not going to the start line and not expecting to be all the way to Paris. Well, I won't be all the way to Paris, but I'll be all the way to London 21 times. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Ed, do you have any thoughts or about... I think I think Phil's got the yellow jersey uh, right. That that makes a lot of sense uh, to me. Uh, in terms of an asterisk connects to this, if the race has ended early, I, Phil can probably speak more intelligently to this. But uh, you pull a yellow jersey on at any time in your career uh, as a as a Tour de France bike racer, and it's a it's a life changing moment. So even if the race does end early uh, that yellow jersey will be regarded because we are going to the start line knowing that this could happen so like phil said the the uh, winner of stage one could be the winner of the race and that, that mm -hmm. will change racing dynamics i would assume um, i'll make a uh, a green jersey prediction as i understand it this this uh, mm -hmm. tour is going to be very difficult uh, and it's going to require a special sprinter to take the to take the green jersey, and I think that special sprinter is uh, Peter Sagan. He's one of the best bike handlers in the the, the sport has ever seen. Bill talked about these dangerous descents. Uh, they should not be any problem for uh, for for Peter. And I would I would think that he will be able to haul himself up over these mountains and finish the race wearing the green jersey. Great prediction. I can't argue with that, Ed. <laughs> Every time he's finished the tour, he's won the green jersey. I think this will be his, it's either his eighth or his ninth green jersey. I'm losing count. I'll have to check that one. Great. Okay. Well, again, this is recorded, so we'll see how it fares during the tour. Um, <laughs> oh, now you tell me. <laughs> Aaron, any other questions? I know we're going deep in cycling. We don't have a, necessarily have a lot of cycling, pure cycling fans on the call, but this is very interesting just in sport in general and how we're seeing professional sports and outdoor sports play during this pandemic. I mean, it's just, it's a big experiment. It's a global experiment that we really don't know what the outcome will be yet. So it's, it is wonderful that we don't. The, 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 the bikes have become so big in England as well that they're, they're seeing so much of it. That volume is showing up here as well. It's a, it's a wonderful sign, I think, for health and wellness in general and getting outdoors is a really good indication across the board. And I, I should, for those who have not watched the Tour de France, I highly recommend watching it. If you think about that as a sport, as, a, as a, something to accomplish, the number of days that you have to get on a bike and make it through each of those days, right? Is it an extremely challenging effort? And people talk about the tenacity and the toughness of, of athletes 
and certain athletes and certain sports are tougher and stronger and meaner and, and all the other things. I think cycling um, always, in my mind, takes the high mark because of what it takes to accomplish that particular race. It is mm. immensely intense. Just watch any documentary on it. More than likely, it's Phil's voice is in that documentary in some form. Um, <laughs> so you can enjoy that as well. But yeah, I, um, it is, it's, an, uh, it's an amazing sport. And the fascinating thing is from, you know, when you can actually balance yourself on a bike until way late in life, you can be out there doing this exercise and enjoy it and, and, and have your road ID in case something goes very, very wrong out there. Um, and rather inspired stories in general. Thank you, gentlemen, for doing this and participating with us, um, providing us some insights into the world and, and sharing everyone, sharing with everyone all these, these great stories. So I hope everybody gets a chance to at least watch the Tour de France, enjoy the voices, enjoy the, the racing. It is a, it's a fascinating experience. Um, someday I want to actually be there and be in the mountains and watch it go by in a hurry and watch the speed and the intensity of it myself. Um, uh, anyway, so that's all I've got, Kelly. Yeah, Can no, Phil, I, this, this was fantastic. And, uh, and I, I will also say Tour de France, historical, the storytelling that happened, seeing these cities and towns across Europe, it's not just about a bike race. So just even an understanding of the history and the culture of these areas, Phil and you and Paul always did it so beautifully. Um, so we're excited to see how that unfolds this week, this next week. So thank you. Well, well, I've just printed the historic book off today, Kelly. Okay. 553 pages. I hope I'll find the right page on the right stage. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt you will. No doubt you will. No doubt.